on. Um, I wanted to just point out that I live in my area of ministry too. I live in Annapolis, Maryland, which is a state capital, and it's close to Washington, D.C., which is our federal capital, and I work a lot with uh, public servants, with the uh, government. So kind of my neighborhood is these policy people making the laws that you have to live under, and I'm glad to be right there in the middle of it. But I was raised as a missionary kid. I see myself as someone doing Christian ministry and public policy. So I want to talk to you about uh, charitable choice. Uh, there's going to be some detail here, but you have a lot of that detail on the handouts you're getting. So you don't have to madly write notes, but just kind of listen and uh, see what makes sense here. We're going to talk about uh, why charitable choice, kind of an introduction to it, uh, charitable choice in your ministry, what about laws outside of charitable choice, then implementing charitable choice or the lack of that by states, and then finally action you can take. All right, so we'll run through that pretty quickly. So why charitable choice? Well, you all know that welfare and other social services are being made collaborative. Government would like to draw on the strengths of faith-based and community organizations. You all know that. You're on the spot. You're trusted by folks. You know the turf. You know who the people are. You deal holistically with the persons, their net networks. You deal with morals and values. Government values that. They know that's important. The question is, what makes a good collaboration? Government has often turned to the non-governmental sector for services. There's a long history of government contracting with religiously affiliated service providers. But the government usually wants vendors to provide assistance in government's own mold. That's been the traditional model. If the goal of collaboration is that government can offer assistance that's different, then that relationship has to change. From a buyer-vendor relationship to one that's more like allies that together are serving needy folks and neighborhoods. A change in the terms of the relationship is especially important in the case of faith-based organizations because the rules in the past have been highly restrictive for your ministries. What's new here is not just a different attitude, but specific new legal rights and understandings. And it's a change at the heart of government's relations with outside organizations. When government spends money, contracts for services, that's where this change is taking place. In my view, charitable choice dramatically increases the opportunities for churches and other faith-based organizations to compete to provide services, to get some of that government funds under appropriate circumstances to serve people better. But I want to say right up front that charitable choice does not mean that every church and ministry ought to go hunting for government funds. That's not what this is all about. It does not mean that only services funded by government are worthwhile. That would be a big mistake if we thought that. And it does not mean that Christian ministries should stop serving the needy unless they can work out some kind of deal with government. So that'd all be wrong. But the question is, if you are working with government or think that's appropriate, what's that relationship going to be like? And that's what charitable choice deals with. Charitable choice does mean that ministries that have a good reason to seek government funds have new opportunities to collaborate in a relationship that respects them as ministries. Why would you want to collaborate? More resources. But there are people in mandatory government-funded programs that got to get 20 hours of job training, they've got to get this service, they have to go to that place, and their services ought to be the best possible. Ineffective services that government currently funds ought to get replaced, right? We shouldn't keep doing that. Oops. And Christians, I think, should rise to the challenge to help construct a social safety net in which ministries are integral and not just out in the margins as we've been in the past. And we're in the phase of reconstructing the social safety net for good and ill, and I think Christians ought to rise to the, to the challenge to be part of that. Nevertheless, collaboration is not for everyone. Don't just do it because money is available, because officials seek your help. You've got to carefully and prayerfully evaluate the terms of that relationship, what the laws are all about, whether you can successfully provide the desired help, whether you can manage the funds and paperwork and all that. You must be sure you can collaborate without harming your mission or becoming dependent on government funds. Right? Okay, so what's charitable choice all about? It's not just a louder and warmer invitation for you folks to come to the table. It's not a separate program of money for ministries. 
It's not a government program that just funds religion because it's good stuff. Instead, this is a set of new rules for state and local government, procurement of services, grants and contracts, buying services from religious organizations. The new rules apply whenever state and local governments use certain funds. There's not a set aside for religious organizations. You can compete for all those programs, all the money that's covered by charitable choice. In other programs, under other rules, typically only religiously affiliated nonprofits are eligible. You can't be too religious, or they don't want to fund you. Charitable choice says that churches, under certain circumstances, and faith based nonprofits are eligible. It's okay if your faith is written all over your program. Typically, in the past, uh, you often had to remove religious symbols. Those are protected under charitable choice. Uh, laws have often said no religious influence or language is permitted. Within limits, under charitable choice, faith-based concepts and talk are permitted. And finally, often the government rule is no religion is allowed in hiring. You can't select people on the basis of faith. We find ways around that, but the law says you can't do that. Charitable choice says you can do that. That's how you preserve your ministry. That's all right. That's protected in the law. So here's the idea. A level playing field, pervasively sectarian organizations, churches, faith-based nonprofits, cannot be excluded from competing in these programs. But faith-based organizations have no right to receive funding. Government ought to fund the best programs. Can't be kept out. You won't automatically get the money. You got to prove you can do the work. Seems right to me. You have the right to keep control of your board of directors. You don't have to reconstitute that for someone else's idea. Maintain your faith-based mission statement. Maintain a religious environment, Christian name, Christian symbols, all that kind of stuff that's important to you. Retain your exemption that permits hiring only staff that agrees with your ministry's mission. You have that right if you don't take government funds. If you take funds covered by charitable choice, you still have that right. You can't discriminate in general, however. In return, you've got to meet the same bookkeeping standards as others. You've got to provide effective assistance, of course. You've got to serve every client without religious discrimination. You have to serve clients even if they don't want to participate in inherently religious activities. We'll come back to this. If they don't want to hear the gospel message, you still have to promise to serve them. And you promise to use the government funds only for the specified purposes, not to build up your church or for other purposes. Right? You said you're going to do job training. That's what you're going to do. Charitable choice, in addition to saying clients will get served without discrimination, they don't have to sit through something that they morally object to, it says that government must arrange an alternative for a client who doesn't want to be served by a faith-based provider. So there's a protection there for people who, for whatever reason, don't want to come to your ministry, and government has to guarantee that. These rules apply to the TANF money, the basic welfare grant that states get from the federal government, to the Welfare to Work program adopted in 1997, to community services block grants that fund community action agencies, provide a lot of services for neighborhoods. And then just in October, the president signed uh, the reauthorization of SAMHSA with certain federal drug treatment funds are now covered by charitable choice. So what's this mean for you? You have to ask yourself, are you able to provide the specific services that would be required? Provide effective services? Do you provide a sufficient volume of services? Right? You think about these things when you contract. Can you document what you do and how it works? Can you keep close account of your income and spending to uh, properly select and manage staff and volunteers? These are all things, obligations you take on when you take someone else's funds. Can you coordinate your help with the services others provide? That's all important in providing good services. And in addition, can you offer a faith-based program that does not spend government funds on evangelism and Bible study? That would be a requirement under charitable choice. And can you offer a faith-based program that doesn't require clients to take part in worship and Bible study or evangelism unless they choose to? They have to be able to get the service without that if that's their choice. That's what the law says. If not, then you should seek funds some other way and not under this. But ask yourself,
does prayer and Bible study and evangelism always have to be part, an obligatory part, of every service that honors God and is effective? Is that true? All the things you might want to do. If it is, then you have to say, this doesn't work for me. If you can make those elements a voluntary part that you win people to by your witness, by the way you run your program, that's fine. When you assess collaboration, though, I think we have to ask not just, will there be limits on me, but will this allow me to serve the folks I want to serve better? They're out there. They need job training. They need to get out of drugs. They need to get over alcoholism. They need to learn how to manage their family. Will I be able to do that better if I take these funds, even if I have to redesign my service a little bit? So that's, I think, what we have to think about when it comes to government funding. Charitable choice does have limits, you just heard them, but it provides new opportunities and new protections. Outside of charitable choice, because it only applies to certain funds, other federal funds have other rules, and often those rules are much more restrictive. So I don't want to pick on HUD, but they do a lot of funding, and they have actively reached out to faith-based groups, and I think that's wonderful. They're making it much easier to apply for funds, get technical assistance. But HUD funds typically come with secularizing strings. That's the way Congress did it. Often, distinctly faith-based organizations are not eligible. Programs have to be devoid of religion and religious influence. That's what the statutes typically say. Providers cannot take faith into account in hiring. In practice, things are more flexible. And HUD funds can be used carefully to serve neighbors and honor God. Some of your ministries do that. But it's a much more restrictive environment than charitable choice provides. And I think we uh, should think about this, that charitable choice was written exactly to get rid of a lot of those restrictions. Officials sometimes are flexible despite restrictions, but the laws and regulations they're supposed to apply often are highly restrictive. And if your ministry received government funds and then was called in by an official who demanded that you ban religious influences or didn't hire your next staff taking their faith into account, wouldn't you rather have charitable choice to back you up and tell that official to back off instead of you being subject to a law that says that person's right and you ought to not be doing the things you've been doing. So there are new protections, I think, that are very important in charitable choice, even though it's not the end, uh, the final word. Now, what's going on with charitable choice out in the states? It's only words in the federal law books until states change their own practices, right? If they keep putting all these restrictions on you, even if the federal government says not, you're still in the same boat. Good intentions aren't enough. The question is, what happens when you go to sign that contract? Or you apply for funds, and they say, sorry, you're faith-based, can't work with you. Right? So if the federal government says they ought to change, the state doesn't change, you're in the same boat as in the past. States ought to be doing things like getting rid of language that ex excludes faith-based organizations from contracts and RFPs. They ought to be creating an exemption that says you can choose people on the basis of faith, because that's what charitable choice says you can do. And contracts and vouchers and so on ought to ensure the rights of clients. These are all things that states ought to be doing. But as of this fall, most states have not made some or all of the changes that charitable choice requires them to make after four years. In these states, procurement is conducted as if charitable choice would never adopted even if there may be more flexibility than in the past. You'll still run into all the same barriers in many states. In states that are not compliant with charitable choice, even if there's greater flexibility, faith-based organizations still face barriers, and state and local agencies still are unable to enter into all of the productive relationships that they ought to be able to. So what's going on? We graded, after an exhaustive uh, questionnaire and other investigations, four states with A's, Indiana, Ohio, Texas, and Wisconsin. Four with Bs are doing fairly well, Arizona, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Four states have started off on the process the way they should, Arkansas, California, Michigan, and North Carolina, and all the rest flunk. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. You'll still find restrictions that are illegal in all those states. The list is on your piece of paper as well. So what can you do about that? Well. Don't let the opportunity pass by. If appropriate, consider competing for government funds. We ought to think about the new opportunities there are. If contracting is an appropriate, consider non-financial collaboration. Do referrals. Work out other ways to work with government. I think that's very important. 
But if your officials aren't doing what the law requires, educate yourself and then educate them. They'll probably say, I never heard of this, even though it's been handed out to them in the past. Collaborate non-financially if they still put these barriers in the way. Find other ways to work with the programs. Respectfully request that charitable choice be put into practice as it's supposed to be. And that's what this piece of paper is all about. It tells you about charitable choice. It tells you what states are doing, what they're supposed to. And I would urge you to sign it, and circulate it to others, and give it to your state and local officials and say, why isn't this being applied the way it should be in our state or our county? Even if it's just your name on it, it may be the first person that's asked them to obey the law, except for us. And if your name is on that, they're going to pay attention because someone found them out. Or give it to a reporter. Reporters are starting to sneak around and ask these states, why are they non-compliant? Why do they still have all these barriers? All right, so let's stir up some dust. We're not asking for anything other than what the law says. And I think we ought to ask it, even if we're not personally going to apply for funds. Uh, you got the petition. You can copy it. You can get it off our website. It contains basic information about charitable choice, kind of a reminder. It gives you the grades. Use it for information. Use it to connect with other ministries, point of contact, discussion. Use it to stir up those officials in the press. Four years later, they ought to be doing something. Uh, there are resources like this at uh, www.cpjustice.org. That's on this as well. The Guide to Charitable Choice gives all the technical details that officials need and you might need. The National Report Card on Charitable Choice that you can download and print on legal size paper. This petition is on there. There's a great catalog of collaborations, innovative things going on that Amy Sherman did for us, and there are other resources. So, Charitable choice is the law of the land. In certain areas, you are supposed to be free to do new things. The government is not always doing that. Let's hold our feet to the fire, and when it's appropriate, go after those funds, engage in those collaborations that will allow us to serve those needy folks better. Thank you.